So, hello. Um, yeah, thank you, everyone, for having me here. Um, and just before I get started, I'd like to say thank you to the organizers of the conference. Um, I was here in 2019, which feels like a lifetime ago now. I uh, had a great old time, and uh, given the couple of years that we've all had since then, um, I think it's incredible that uh, people have been able to put on such a, an impressive and large-scale event. So um, thank you to the organizers. Uh, I'm also quite pleased because uh, it's actually the first time uh, in quite some time, actually, that I've given a presentation uh, fully dressed, so um, that's very, <laughs> very, very nice to be back in that world, at least. Um, so, first things out of the way, um, who am I and why am I even here today talking to you? Um, well, like I say, my name's Dom Weldon, and when I'm in this part of the world, I'm always uh, very careful because I know that in most Central European languages, oh, oh, I'm sorry, I should say, I'm from uh, Central London, uh, which is the land of Brexit, going as well as I think anyone thought it would be. And um, <coughs> just before I come to exactly who I am, and this is the sort of uh, world of technology that I live in. I'm a cloud software engineer, um, and I work primarily at the moment for uh, this company, Decision Lab. Um, we are a mathematical modeling consultancy um, based in central London, work mostly in defense, uh, intelligence, engineering, uh, and sort of related um, fields for a number of clients, including um, uh, people such as those up there. Um, and like I said as well, uh, I am also always careful when I'm in this part of the world. Um, I know that in most Central European languages, DOM generally tends to mean uh, house or something very kind of similar. Um, being a web developer called DOM as well is also a bit confusing because I am obviously the document object model. Uh, but I was in the Netherlands uh, speaking quite recently and uh, I realized actually that in the Netherlands, DOM has a completely different meaning, which is similar in, uh, in German as well, DOM or DOOM. So I have to be careful not to go around introducing myself as uh, stupid Weldon. But um, you can call me that if you want. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so the title of this talk, like I say, it's Forget Web 3.0. Let's talk about the early history of the web or Web 0. Um, and so it's really a brief history of the internet and the World Wide Web. And um, it's a little bit of an experimental talk uh, for me at PyCon. Um, and the reason I wanted to give it was because I feel that a lot of the introductory materials for uh, junior developers or people starting out to do web development tend to focus very much on uh, straight away kind of building code and getting, uh, you know, start installing Django um, or you know, checking out a branch on um, a particular project to uh, really start kind of hacking away very quickly. And that's great because it means that people can build things quickly and easily. But um, especially with all of the discussion at the moment, um, the excited discussion really about Web3 and uh, you know, the metaverse and all these other sort of technologies, um, I really think that we would be better informed by understanding the history and the past of the web and the internet generally um, to actually really inform our discussion going forwards about what the future of these technologies might look like. Um, this is particularly relevant for me. My background um, before I decided to stop and become a software engineer um, was in academia and research, uh, particularly in digital humanities and the history of network technologies. I was uh, at Cambridge for a long time before I moved to King's for my doctoral thesis, um, and then I, I studied the history of the uh, telephone network essentially in the UK um, and got more interested in uh, Neo4j and Python than uh, necessarily finishing my thesis. So, um, <clears throat> this talk is a summary of some of the history of network technologies undergraduate course uh, that's um, taught at King's College London. I'm aware that this is a sort of semester long course generally, so um, this is a very uh, quick rendition uh, and there is a focus to on, on Python. <coughs> so. Uh, let's, let's look at network technologies generally. And the first thing to, to note about network tech uh, is that it's not new. Uh, te you could imagine the post office and sort of um, even horses going around delivering messages um, you know, hundreds of years ago as being a network technology. Um, when we start to think about electronic or the kind of the digital age, telegraph systems are pretty much where everyone will start. They emerge around the 1830s, get very big in the uh, 1850s and continue on. And just, just like the internet or um, the web in a sense, uh, the you know, te uh, telegraphs were terminals that were connected by wires. There were lots of people operating them at various different stations. Uh, and they all used a shared protocol, um, which in this case was Morse code, you can imagine here. The thing about these networks though, is that they are point to point networks. Um, you can re me relay messages between stations from A to B, but you can't have a big full network. You're not routing messages around there. 
It's also quite human intensive, uh, and these aren't technologies that people would necessarily have in their house. Um, you, if you wanted to send a telegram to someone, then the, the message would actually arrive by a telegraph boy or a telegram boy, um, such as these ones here in central London. And um, it's a very um, manual, sort of labor intensive process. But it does shape a lot of the Victorian world. Um, it becomes a, a global network. We have telegraphs that go all over the world. The first transatlantic cable uh, emerged in about the, 18, the late 1850s. Um, like any good technology project, it broke almost immediately. So it uh, wasn't, wasn't quite as reliable as we might, might hope. Um, <clears throat> and then a little bit later on, we start to uh, see the introduction of the telephone uh, with Alexander Graham Bell there in the 1870s. Uh, and, was, uh, and again, this is shown to work over long distances using mostly telephone wires. And if you want a, um, a picture of the first ever telephone uh, that was invented, that was uh, on the patent here for Graham Bell in uh, 1876. Again, this initially is a technology of um, capital. It's point-to-point, uh, -point, again, uh, or dyadic. So um, the, the idea would be that you'd have someone like your, your big capitalist um, factory owner boss at the top there uh, with uh, you know, calling down to his, uh, his underlings in the factory to try and coordinate operations. It wasn't, wasn't a network. But it was later combined with um, an emerging idea at the time of something called a telegraph exchange. And uh, this is a drawing, uh, a network drawing from uh, the patent for uh, the first ever telegraph exchange in 1851. Uh, and the idea here was that you've got all of these different nodes in this network and you would actually start to be able to connect up the, uh, the wires or the telegraph wires in different ways to route a message through the network. That never really took off with telegraphs um, or, or telegrams, but it did take off with the telephone. And the idea um, was that originally when you um, subscribed to a telephone you, uh, exchange, you would be connected to the exchange. You'd be able to uh, call any other number that was also connected to that exchange. So, uh, it might be you know, people in your town or your part of your city. Um, and the first ever telephone exchange um, operating on, on this model was actually, um, happens to be very near where I, I live and have my office in, uh, in central uh, East London, there on Cobden Street here. Um, <clears throat> later on, we start connecting these um, different exchanges so that you have connections between networks to create a trunk. Um, and this happens in, uh, across Europe, it, this, the, uh, an early network map here for France. Uh, and likewise, we have an early network map for, um, for the UK as well. Um, so if you're familiar with some of the history of the internet, I imagine that some of those diagrams before might start to look a little bit familiar. Um, but just before we start to look at how that developed with the internet, I want to add a little bit of context to, um, to, to how this came about, or the origin story of, uh, of the internet in, in lots of uh, discussion. Uh, and that starts here with Sputnik. Uh, or Sputnik 1, the first ever Russian uh, or Soviet satellite put into space. And it kind of takes the Americans a little bit by surprise. It's, uh, it's quite a shock to suddenly think that there's some massive floating orb sending out this uh, pinging sort of ethereal noise um, going all around the world. And uh, there's lots of uh, newspapers at the time that sort of refer to it as the Russian moon. And um, here that sort of, uh, you, you could actually hear it on a, um, uh, on a uh, radio um, in the States. And this happens at about the same time that primetime television emerges as well. You can think of it almost as being the social media of its day, but primetime starts to emerge in the US. And so you get a really concerned, committed public consuming news very quickly and starting to really, really panic about what's happening up in space. <clears throat> so this really provides a catalyst, particularly for um, Eisenhower, the uh, general president um, that uh, was in office at the time, to start investing heavily in science and technology research. Uh, and this is really when we see a lot of American US, um, uh, US science agencies like NASA and so on um, emerge. One of those agencies, uh, if you're familiar with the history of the internet, was the Advanced Research Projects Agency, uh, which would later become DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. And this is particularly significant because <coughs> um, at, at the time, uh, at the time, the um, uh, uh, yeah, so so it's particularly significant because um, at the time of um, the development of this network, um, computers we can see looked uh, a little bit like this. There were big, heavy, chunky boxes um, that would uh, uh, be exist mostly in sort of research institutes or universities, occasionally in the odd uh, the odd 
business as well. Um, but these um, uh, terminals were starting to be connected to one another, kind of like those sort of dyadic connections between telegraphs that we, we saw earlier. <clears throat> and the idea behind the original ARPANET was that uh, rather than just having individual connections between two research institutes and having to go to a different computer if you wanted to talk to a different research institute, you could connect all of the computers um, at various different research institutes into a single network so long as they all use the same protocol and the same you know, agreed methods for communicating between computers. Uh, and so if you've heard of, if you operate that far down in the, uh, in the network layer um, and you've heard of packet switching, um, then this is where that technology emerges from. And the first four nodes or computers on the, uh, the ARPANET uh, were these four um, in uh, California and one in Utah. Uh, and it really was this uh, connection between these, uh, these computers, which is the birth of what we might think of now as being the modern internet. Um, <clears throat> the first ever message as well that was sent, uh, actually was sent in, uh, oh, I didn't put the, the year on this, but it was 1963, uh, at 10.30 p.m. in the evening, a graduate student working late called Charlie Klein, um, he tried to send a message log to uh, log into a remote terminal, but uh, obviously his computer crashed before he got to the G, so the, uh, the first ever message transmitted on, uh, on the internet was low. Um, and like I say, the, the, um, Charlie Klein was supervised by uh, Leonard Kleinrock, who gets a lot of the, um, the kind of credit for the early history of this part of the internet, uh, you can see here, but it was actually the graduate student uh, himself, Charlie Klein, who, um, who sent that message there. And here he is looking puzzled at uh, UCLA several, um, several decades later. <clears throat> and how do we know this? Because, well, we can look at the log files for it. Um, obviously, these are slightly different to what you might see in CloudWatch, um, and Guardrail and things like that didn't exist at this point. Um, but uh, yeah, this was the, uh, the first ever log of uh, an internet message happening uh, back in 1963. Uh, and there's a great film, actually, that I would recommend uh, by Werner Herzog um, called Lo and Behold, that actually takes that low message um, and uh, kind of uh, explores the early history of the internet and also uh, some of the kind of the social consequences of it, although obviously it being in 2016, um, it's somewhat uh, somewhat out of date now or you know, kind of of its time. So the ARPANET, uh, the ARPANET grows, a lot more nodes are added. Uh, you can see it becomes an international network here with the, uh, the addition of London and uh, the uh, other connections through from London to, um, to Paris. Um, I'm not sure when Berlin came online, but around the, this time in the late 70s. Uh, and there were also iterations where other networks were added, um, and they had this concept of internetworking. So we had other networks that were being set up in other parts of the United States, other parts of Europe, um, and that were also operating packet switching uh, and connecting these networks together. We, uh, we developed the, uh, the concept of the internet. Uh, and you can see so how the, 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 kind of the network here develops over time. Another great book uh, that's worth, worth reading about the history of this, this period uh, is where wizards stay up late, um, and it's a you know, history of the, the early development of ARPANET and the internet. And <clears throat> often in these histories as well, it, though it's tempting to see that a lot of um, these stories revolve around individuals and uh, generally sort of, the, you know, if you look at the cover of that book, lots of, um, you know, lots of white uh, middle-aged guys or you know, uh, young sort of graduate students, and that, that's really where you get the, uh, the story of it. Um, however, there are lots of other voices here that um, aren't covered in as extensive detail, and one of them, for example, is uh, Elizabeth Feinler. Um, the, the development of the domain name system is almost synonymous these days with, uh, with John Postel, but uh, uh, Feinler, uh, her work was at the Network Information Center at, uh, at ARPA, um, and she was just as, uh, just as influential in the development of what, what would become DNS. Um, so we've, we've had a look at the development of some networks. We've looked at this, the Victorian sort of telegraph network that emerges. We've looked at the, um, you know, the development and the history of the ARPANET. Uh, and you can kind of trace that through now to see um, if you look at something like the modern-ish uh, modern map of uh, you know, submarine cables that are transmitting you know, fiber optic cables between, between different parts of the world here. But really, we've, we've only discussed the internet and not really the World Wide Web. So if we just to be very clear about the distinction here between the internet and the World Wide Web. When we talk about the internet, we mean a network of cables, hardware, infrastructure, and so on, connecting um, all, of, uh, all of our devices. Whereas when we're talking about the World Wide Web, we're talking about something a bit more abstract, a bit more ethereal, uh, a web of documents which is accessed via the internet. And so classically, we think of the World Wide Web as being a hypertext, but hypertexts also aren't new, like a network technology. Uh, you see 
or if, you're, you know, if you watch a film, all of the hacker HTML coming across the screen and so on. And that's really what we think of as being a hypertext maybe these days, HTML. Um, but it comes from the Greek meaning beyond text uh, and a non-linear fashion of reading uh, interconnected information. And, and crucially, it relies on the idea of having user interaction. Um, because you know, categorizing and sorting information is not new, but what a hypertext offer, uh, you know, that's what you see in a library, what a hypertext offers is the ability for a user to navigate through the web and create their own trails of information as they wish to see. Um, so a very early kind of theoretical concept of this was something called the Memex. Uh, it was proposed by a, a defense technologist, uh, Vannevar Bush, who would be um, kind of huge in the um, defense science of the Cold War. Um, and it was in 1945, he published a very influential um, uh, paper called uh, As We May Think in the Atlantic, where he proposed this sort of um, kind of like steampunk internet uh, or steampunk web browser, where you'd be able to view information on two screens and enter codes and interact with the screens in order to be able to, um, to navigate a trail and discover new information through um, an early system of hypertext. And um, even designed how it could operate, and the idea was that it'd be this big wooden desk uh, and that you'd be able to send mem um, memexes, which would be a bit like a microfiche to each other in the post, uh, and you know, subscribe to newspapers and so on using, uh, using this special device. Um, which is not a million miles away from how we operate a web browser these days, but um, obviously no one gets, uh, gets their packets in the post. And <clears throat> hypertexts were explored in the early history of computing. Uh, one example is this hypertext editing system. Uh, it's developed by um, uh, the, a number of scientists at Brown. Um, but like web browsers these days, it required an enormous amount of memory to be able to operate. Uh, and obviously, um, early computers didn't tend to have that much memory, nor do many laptops these days. So uh, yeah, uh, your web browser crashing because uh, too much memory is being consumed was a, a very early problem in the history of the web. And um, <clears throat> if we look at sorting information generally, though on the internet or on the early ARPANET, um, this was done by a number of different, different systems throughout the, uh, the 70s and the 80s. Uh, Usenet is a very common one. Um, but it was really the uh, <coughs> invention of, uh, or the publication of a proposal by Tim Berners-Lee, uh, who was a scientist working at CERN, uh, that gave us the origin of the, the World Wide Web, as we know it, to, to organize documents. And one of my favorite quotes from this, this document, which I would recommend you read, is uh, you know, it explains we need a system of circles and arrows uh, that which leave people to free to describe interrelationships between things in a way that tables do not. And so the system we need is like a, a diagram of circles and arrows where circles and arrows can stand for anything. Um, but crucially, as well as publishing this document, Berners-Lee also published the first source code for the first ever web browser, which he actually called World Wide Web. Um, he developed it over a number of months with uh, a number of students that were also working at CERN. And you can see here, um, this is roughly what it looked like, um, so a little bit different from uh, Chrome or uh, Firefox that you might think of these days. And it was both uh, a web browser and uh, an HTML sort of WYSIWYG editor. Um, but it was really this, this opening up of the web and the World Wide Web that started to make the internet a commercial reality or a commercial proposition, rather than just being a way for scientists to share data sets uh, or for defense um, institutions to share information as well. It offered things that consumers or businesses might actually want, um, which in the, you, know, you can see the home page here for AOL in 1994. Um, and a number of other developments happen over the course of the next sort of 10 to 20 years. Um, I'm really speeding up some of, uh, <laughs> some of the history of this here. Um, but some of the big keystones were uh, the release of Netscape Navigator in 1994, which allowed the first ever HTTPS connections by standard, um, or, you know, by uh, your kind of average user, um, which meant that you could start to do things like you know, pay um, or you know, conduct commercial transactions over the internet. Um, likewise, in 2000, uh, the Clinton government opens up the uh, GPS system to uh, a much greater level of accuracy than had been available to civilians before, which means that we now have um, location-based services and devices that became possible. And then likewise, in the uh, late 90s to the early 2000s, uh, we start to see the emergence of uh, what's sometimes still called AJAX, or um, asynchronous JavaScript and, H uh, and XML, or AJAJ, as it would probably be now. Um, which is the idea that uh, you know, web pages can do things more than just display information. You can load um, information from external sources and so on. Uh, and obviously, Python's been quite a significant part of this story. 
um, coming out uh, in the early 19, uh, well, uh, around about 1990, um, being conceptualized uh, in the, the late 80s. Uh, and you can see here the original Python logo until 2006 as well. It's, uh, it's a little bit different these days uh, in terms of the visuals. Um, <clears throat> but there have been a number of frameworks that have been used to re uh, create Python web servers and uh, you know, handle requests. Um, right since, I think, about 1994 with the publication of uh, Kyoto, which is still going um, to this day. You can, uh, if you wanted to spin up um, a web app using Kyoto, apparently, um, that's, that's still going. Um, as is the Zope project, uh, which uh, Guido himself actually worked on for, uh, for a number of years. Um, another significant development as well that happened in terms of Python, you've got the uh, emergence of the WSGI standard um, in a uh, number of PEPs related to that, um, and the foundation of uh, the yeah, but Django framework that uh, many of us will have used in the past uh, in yeah, the Lawrence World Journal at Kansas. Uh, it's been going since 2003. Um, and now, obviously, we see that there's quite a, an ecosystem or a plethora of various different web frameworks uh, today that um, have all kind of emerged throughout the course of this story. Um, <clears throat> but I think the reason why all of this is relevant, particularly to us as um, you know, programmers or web developers, yeah, is because, well, there's lots of discussion at the moment, isn't there, about the future of uh, the web, the metaverse, Web3, all the daft ape token things. Um, and there are lots of significant criticisms and risks associated with that. And, um, you know, it's probably too early to tell whether or not um, you know, these technologies are a fad or whether or not they'll uh, actually kind of continue to shape our lives or you know, you know, uh, shape the story of the web or if other technologies will come along as well. Um, but they are also getting significant um, you know, exposure. And to my, um, my government's shame, uh, our chancellor, who um, it turns out last week, um, his family haven't been paying tax for a long time. Um, our, our chancellor has uh, decided to um, create an official government NFT for some bizarre reason. But uh, it does, does show that these, um, these technologies are getting respect in more serious circles. However, I think that actually to have a good understanding of the history of the web is really quite essential in shaping the future of the web as we can understand it. I mean, we've seen here, you know, going from getting information from telegraph boys, uh, you know, not in the not too distant past, to the development of uh, ARPANET through to the birth of the World Wide Web, and now talking about the future of all these other unusual technologies. However, I think <clears throat> the key point that we really need to remember when we're thinking about being a web developer or about a, a you know, a developer or anyone who writes code or you know, touches or is involved with code generally to do with the web. Um, the web is a really, really young technology. So I've given a little timeline here, and this is a very um, contracted timeline of the history of the World Wide Web. Um, started in 1989 uh, with uh, the release of um, information management proposal and the first ever web browser. Uh, and I'm not meaning to suggest that fast API it is very good, um, and hats off to Sebastian. I'm not meaning to suggest that that's the pinnacle of the web, like, like we are, <laughs> you seem to see on this timeline now. But um, you can see there's some sort of key elements that have happened here along the way that we've mentioned. And this also happens to be roughly the timeline of uh, my life. I was born in uh, 1990, um, so almost as old as the web. Um, and I thought that it's probably not that far off, at least a you know, median or mean average of you know, people in this room or people at the conference, you know, um, apologies if uh, that's way off in either direction, <laughs> um, but it's, uh, you know, it's not a bad estimate of, uh, of people's ages here, or maybe it is. Um, but let's say, <clears throat> if we're saying people, you know, about 30-ish my age today, it wouldn't be unreasonable to think that people who are in their 30s now might live into their 80s. That's, you know, quite a lot of uh, people you would really would hope would live to that age and probably far beyond. And if we were to draw that into our timeline, um, it starts to look very, very different, doesn't it? Um, you can see here that actually we're really only towards the start of having web technologies as a part of our lives. Um, the internet is a little bit older, but actually the World Wide Web really is something with a lot of future in it and a lot of different directions it can go on. And so, I'm not suggesting that um, by any stretch of the imagination that anything like Web3 or the metaverse is the be all and end all to that. But actually, if we want to understand what might be in the future, we really should start paying attention to what's in the history in the past of the web. So hopefully I've whetted your appetite a little bit there. 
um, to find out more about these histories and to, um, to really start to understand uh, you know, the deep history of the web to get a better idea of what, what will be going forward. So thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you very much for this talk. We have now five minutes time for questions. I do not see any questions online, so we can start by taking questions from the audience. Please raise your hand if you have a question. Sorry. <laughs> ah, there's a question in the very, oh, okay, let's start here. Okay, thank you. So first, uh, thanks, very interesting talk. Um, and well, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, I think that when the internet started and the world, web, the world wide web started, decentralization and redundancy were key parts of the idea. But now we, have, we live in a world where it's the other way around. We have centralized services with exclusive access, and it's all in close hands of very big companies. And the question is, where shall we head in the future to like somewhere in the middle we should go back or what's your idea regarding this mm. um yeah well i think um yeah well i think the big change really between um you know the development of the web in the 70s and the 80s uh, at that point was obviously the, the redundancy was built in because oh if you've got a node in say chicago that connects new york to um Los Angeles, then I'm not sure why it'd go via Chicago, but um, then, uh, you know, and Chicago gets bombed, then you, you take that out, you really need that, that kind of wartime resiliency. And you know, may, maybe <laughs> events at the moment are quite, quite uncertain, but, you know, maybe that, that will become important again. But I think actually the centralization of the web, particularly into um, uh, the big cloud providers, um, it, it is sort of essential for doing business and for having that kind of, um, you know, reliability. Uh, on there as well. So where, where that leads in the future, I think, is anyone's guess. But, um, but yeah, I think the, um, the, the priorities have shifted somewhat, at least. So Great. Um, oh, thank you. Are we... we have one more question um, online. It's a bit provocative question, but how does web survive <coughs> when Web3 balloon will blow up? What does Web4 look like? Uh, well, I, th I, 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 t I think the answer to that would be for people to really dig into the history of the web and to start making your own, your own opinions. Um, I would say I, I definitely agree that Web3 is probably a scam, <laughs> um, like, <laughs> like, like most of crypto, to be honest. Um, yeah, let's, let's be completely frank about it. Um, but we've got to remember, like, you know, these technologies that connect each uh, everyone together in the world are here to stay. They've been being developed since, well, you know, since time immemorial, but using wires since the 1850s, and that's going to carry on. There's already been one bubble, the dot-com bubble. Um, maybe we're seeing another one in the Web3 at the moment. Um, other things will come, and they will be better. So, it's time for one more question from the audience. Yep. Uh, hi there. Once again, thank you for the presentation. It was really good. Um, it's clear you have criticisms of, of Web3, and I, I share them. But uh, on, on a more positive note, do you see any actual use cases for the emerging crypto uh, world and blockchain? Is Where, where is that going to take us in a, in a more positive way? I'm, well, I was going to say, I, you asked me where is it going to take us in a positive way. That there are definite use cases for crypto. Um, a lot of them criminal, though. <laughs> um, uh, so, um, uh, uh, yeah, um, I'm sure there are very specific uh, use cases where maybe um, you know, buying an NFT is the best way to solve a problem. Um, a, a lot of the time, I think if I was going to design a system to solve many of these problems, it would normally be a Postgres database. Um, but uh, I'm sure there are. And uh, I really don't think that um, we should start using sort of hundreds of kilowatt hours to make a transaction to pay for coffee or something like that. So, um, thanks. All right. Uh, that's it for our first talk in this room uh, in the afternoon today. Let's thank our speaker again. And we'll be.